Um, hello, um, my name is Joachim Kudenis and I work for a company called Combel. We're a hosting company in um, Belgium. And um, next to that, I co-organize a local user group um, in Belgium. Um, and today we're going to talk about how doctrine caching can skyrocket your application. Um, I gave this talk before and then I had this um, image uh, as a background. Um, as of last week, I can use the real image instead of the simulation, so yay. Yeah. Um, so this talk is about um, doctrine and um, I will first give a small crash course of doctrine. Then I will talk about the internals because by uh, knowing how doctrine works, you can um, boost the application quite a bit. And at the, at the end, I will uh, talk about adding cache to doctrine. Um, who uses doctrine? All right. Excellent. Um, so there's a small, um, a small disclaimer uh, uh, for this talk. It's only when you're if, uh, using doctrine that it will, if you know how the internals work, uh, that it will skyrocket your application, uh, obviously. So what is doctrine? Doctrine is a object re re relational mapper, and that is a pro programming technique for converting data between incompatible type systems using object-oriented programming languages. So what an ORM uh, basically does is um, mapping um, data from a database into objects that you can use in your application. Um, and vice versa, it will then translate uh, the objects, look for changes in the objects, and persist them back to the database. So before we will have a quick um, introduction of doctrine, uh, there's, there's some uh, terminology that you have to be aware of. Um, we have a concept called entities. Entities are just classes with an identity um, and can have data to it um, and ha can have collections and other stuff. Um, and we have a uh, mapping mechanism which tells doctrine how to map some properties to uh, database tables and how to map collections and that uh, entity to uh, foreign keys and relations uh, in the database. Um, we have repositories, and repositories is a way of um, handling or of uh, fetching entities from the um, object manager, and the object or the entity manager is the way um, we interact with Doctrine to fetch and store entities into the database. So, there's a um, um, getting started tutorial on the website of Doctrine, and there's a GitHub repository um, which contains all the code. Um, I have a small fork of it, um, which, automate, which automates some, uh, some things. So, um, here is my uh, fork, and I can run the tutorial, and it will just um, ex uh, show the PHP examples and then execute them so you know what's, uh, what's going on. So first of all, we just um, install Composer. And if we install Composer, we have the um, vendor directory uh, here on the screen. Um, and we also have some um, basic uh, entities. So we have a, um, we have a product which has an ID and a name. Then we have a, um, a bug, and a bug has a description. It can be filed against a uh, bug, uh, against a product. So it has a list of products, and it, can have, uh, it has an engineer and an assignee. Who, and these are the, uh, this is the user um, entity, which again has a name and then some um, collections referencing the um, uh, the other uh, entities. Um, so we have three entities. We have a mapping system, and the mapping system here is the uh, annotation mapping. So here we say we have an ID value, we have a column um, of a specific type, so the doctrine notes it has to create a voucher. Um, we have uh, some relational um, mapping in in information, so doctrine should know what to do. 
So if we install um, Composure, we have some um, scripts that we can use. And here we see we have a um, schema tool. Um, and I will drop it because I will create it uh, once again. Um, and here we, uh, here we ask the uh, schema tool to read all the annotations and then just generate a databa database for us. Um, in our case, it will generate a SQLite database. So here we have a, a driver, and it will just create this um, SQLite database. So I have uh, dropped it, and I have a new database with all the um, schema um, definitions that are necessary uh, to run this tutorial. So it says don't do this in production because it will just try to um, execute queries to get uh, into the state um, it should be in. And if you do this in production, you should use migrations. Um, and there was a talk already about that. So um, don't do this in production. So. Um, Here we have a, um, a new script, uh, a script that will uh, take an uh, argument and it will just add it to the name uh, of the product. And it will persist the entity into the entity manager and then it will flush it. And the entity manager will make sure it is flushed to the database and give us the ID back. So if I execute it with um, ORM, I will get ID 1. If I execute it with uh, the uh, database extraction, extrapt extrapt Extraction layer, I will get ID 2. And now we have two um, products in the database. And if we list it, we can get a repository from the entity manager and then just find all the products that, were, um, that are, are available in the, in the database and just loop over it. And no big surprise, we see what we just added to the database. We can um, find products directly on ID. Um, also pretty straightforward. Where we can update the product, we find the product based on an ID that was given as an argument. We uh, give it a new name, and then we flush it to the database. And Doctrine will take care of all the um, checking what um, state was changed and what it should uh, render to update the database. So we update the first product to uh, PHP, and that's it. Um, the user, pretty straightforward too. I just create a new user and I get the ID back. And the next thing is the um, is debug. I will try to scroll because it won't be that readable. Um, so for the bug, we have a reporter ID, an assignee ID, and then a list of products that we want to um, link the bug to. So we just fetch the um, uh, the users from the database, we create a new bug, add some values to it, and then loop over every product ID, link it to the bug, and then flush it to the database. Um, again, no big surprise, we have a start entity, and Doctrine takes care of all the um, linking of all the objects. We can uh, query some more. Um, using DQL, and DQL is a variant doctrine query language um, which is a bit simpler uh, or more um, usable in the context of doctrine um, to fetch data and then just loop over the data. Um, and here we see that um, if we fetch the uh, if we fe fetch the bugs, the reporter is also fetched, um, and we can access it through the property. So we can just go through every uh, relation if we want. Um, so I filed one bug. Here it shows up. No big surprise. Um, showing a bug, just the same. And we have, uh, as a final note, a uh, dashboard, which gets all the bugs um, that, are, that I am an assignee of, of uh, or I report it on. And this is just, again, it's showing me how many bugs are open, and um, it displays all the bugs I filed. I talked about repositories, and a repository is a different um, class. In the bug, I uh, mark my class as an entity. And the bug repository uh, as the repository class. 
So every time I request the repository, Doctrine will just give me that, uh, that file. And in that file, um, I have a bit of... Um, I can group commonly um, accessed queries. Um, so this is just a, hand, um, a handy um, system to bundle all the queries. So no surprise, it's just exactly the same. All right, so who learned something? All right, excellent. <laughs> so uh, if you're not using Doctrine, this is how Doctrine works. Um, you uh, work with objects and you don't mind, uh, if you, don't, you don't care how it is persisted in the database. Um, so the only thing we saw with the entity manager is that we persisted uh, entities and that we flushed entities. But how this um, doctrine does this? Um, this is like a high level, um, um, a high level uh, schema of how uh, of the internals of doctrine. So on the left side we have our own application which can query uh, or find um, entities. In the application, we update them and then we flush them back to the entity manager. Uh, we can do that using repositories or we can just ask for a specific uh, entity to the entity manager. On the other side, we have a database abstraction layer. Um, that's a different component and that uh, will take care of um, the different uh, SQL um, variants for like SQL or another database, uh, MySQL or another database. Um, and it will take care of select and uh, update and delete queries. So the big chunk in the middle is the entity manager. And an entity manager, oh, sorry, an entity manager is the central point where our application will communicate to Doctrine and um, request entities and give them back to Doctrine to, um, to manage them and to uh, calculate the differences. Um, Inside the Entity Manager, we have a unit of work. And a unit of work maintains a list of objects affected by a business transaction and coordinates the writing out of the changes and the resolution of concurrency problems. So everything we um, give to the Entity Manager, the Entity Manager internally stores uh, in the unit of work. And everything that is um, changed, we ask the unit of work, what should we do to persist the new state to the database? So um, it keeps track of all the changes that have been made. Um, so Doctrine knows what to write to the database. The unit of work um, is, al is also uh, is responsible for uh, calculating all the differences. And it uses a concept called transactional write-behind. Um, transactional write-behind means it will um, create a very small window where it opens a database transaction and flushes all the uh, changes it has calculated uh, to the database. So if you have a script of a web page that is loading and it's taking five seconds, imagine you open the database uh, transaction and then you fetch the, um, all your uh, records and then you're doing some manipulations to it. And then at the end of the request, you um, uh, commit that transaction. Then you have a lock on your database of five seconds and transactional right behind is um, you do all the logic in your uh, entities and then you uh, give them to the entity manager and the moment you call flush then it will calculate all the things that all the things that have to be done and it will open a database transaction flush all the um, update statements or delete statements and then commit it so it's um, if you change your entity it's not directly um, persisted to the database So inside our unit of work, we have an identity map. And uh, an identity map ensures that each object gets loaded only once by keeping every loaded object in a map. Looks uh, up objects using the map when referring to them. So instead of um, always going to the database and fetching a, an, a record with a given ID, it will first look if it is available in the identity map. And it does that. Uh, it does that uh, to avoid having uh, multiple instances of the same uh, object. So if you have a um, user with my name and we know it was ID1 and we fetch ID1, it is stored in the entity manager and uh, the identity map. And if I do a query 
um, give me all the users with first name Joachim. It will uh, do the query, but then it will see it already has that uh, entity in the uh, identity map. And then it will just um, return that one to avoid having multiple uh, instances. Because if you then flush the entity manager, it won't know which entity is the, is the correct one. So entities are stored in uh, an identity map and they have an, a, a state. We have four states and a doctrine. We have the new one, and this is the one where I just create a new product, and I haven't persisted it to the entity manager, so uh, doctrine doesn't know about it. We have the managed one, and that's the moment I do a persist on the... On the uh, I persist the uh, entity and the entity manager, or if I fetch it from the database, then it's managed too. It could be detached if you um, explicitly asked it to be detached, or if you serialize it, because it's not an object anymore, and then it's to get detached. Or it could be flagged for removal. Um, so, so I, I said we use a transactional right behind. So it's not if you uh, request a removal, it's not directly removed. It's just flagged as removed. And if you flush the, data, uh, flush the entity manager, it will um, effecti effectively remove it from the database. So this is the unit of work, and then here we have uh, persistors and hydrators. And um, a persister is just some kind of serializing to SQL. Um, it has all the changes and it knows how to save it to the database. And the hydrator, is the, it takes the raw data and it hydrates it into objects. Um, and we have to keep the hydration in mind, because this is about skyrocketing sky your application. Um, hydration can take quite a while, um, and sometimes you just don't need it. So if you have raw data and you just have to display it, you don't need to hydrate objects and you can have um, a bit of a performance boost. But hydration just takes raw data, um, puts it in an, in an object that you can interact with. Another concept um, that is used by the entity manager are proxies. Um, proxies are um, lazy loading uh, mechanisms. And it is an object that doesn't contain all of the data you need, but it knows how to get it. So Doctrine uses this in uh, collections. So if you ask for a user, and the user has a assigned box, if you don't use uh, proxies or lazy loading, it will just fetch every. T it, it would store the complete database into into memory because it's it's all related, but you don't know when you need it. So instead of uh, loading the um, properties, uh, instead of loading the relations. Uh, at once, it will just create a proxy object that knows how to load the um, objects. So um, the entity manager just gives you fake objects, but you shouldn't care, at least for now, um, why it does, that. it does that. So now we know the internal workings of Doctrine, and now we can run the, um, run the tutorial again. So if I... If I run it again with the SQL logger, and this is just a flag, um, every SQL um, statement that is executed will show up here on screen. So again, composer install. Here we drop uh, all the tables from the SQL database. Um, here we say create our schema, and you can see that it creates the uh, products and all the um, necessary information. It creates index, indexes on all the foreign keys. Um, so Doctrine does a lot for you, and you don't have to, um, you don't have to care about uh, the internal workings. So if we create a product, the moment we flush, it will just start a transaction, um, create an insert statement, and commit it. The same with the Debo uh, product. Um, if we list the product, it will just create a select statement. Um, to show a specific one, it will, again, select statements and surprisingly add its uh, aware statement to it. And here we have the update. So we first need to um, create the uh, entity into memory. Um, so it does a select statement. We change some, some things. We flush it, and when we flush it, it will see that only the name has changed. So it will open a transaction. This is the transactional right behind. It will open a transaction and update all the uh, data in the database. Same for user in the transaction. 
And here is where it gets interesting. Um, so we have the create bug. And as you can see here, we will find a user with ID 1, which is my ID. And it will find a, uh, the same user, also user 1, but it will use that as the engineer. And then we will um, create the bug itself, then loop over every product and find uh, the product, link it to the bug, and then flush it. And if we execute the script, you will see that it only performs one uh, query to the database. So we requested uh, two users with the same ID, so it will skip the database uh, query and it will just fetch it from the identity map. Um, so we have um, two users with one query, we have the products, and if we then um, save it or flush it to the database, Doctrine knows it has to uh, create a new box uh, record and that we have a many-to-many -many relationship that it has to create uh, statements for that too. So here we have the DQL, um, and that is not um, recognized by the, uh, by the database engine, so it has to create SQL for that. And then here we have a uh, property um, that, we can, um, that we can loop over all the products. And here was where the laser loading will be uh, uh, will kicking will kick in. So here we can see that we have a query that was um, generated. It has generated a SQL query, and this is an, um, a many-to-one relationship. So we can just inner join the engineer and the reporter, and it will just load it in one uh, in one go. And then we we'll loop over the um, products, and the products is a proxy object. So the moment I say get products, it will it will execute the um, the query and get it from the database. Um, so if I load the um, bug from the database and don't touch the get products pr um, method, it, it won't load all the all the objects. So this is something you have to keep in mind to um, make sure you don't load the complete database into memory every time. So show bug, here we see the uh, uh, proxy object again. Um, we get the bug, and then uh, the moment we, had, we hit get, get engineer, it will um, load, lazy load the engineer information from the database. Um, here we have the um, DQL to SQL um, example, and the repository uh, is just the same as before. So we saw all the concepts that we just uh, that we just talked about, um, and we can uh, start using Doctrine a little bit smarter. Um, yeah, to make sure um, we don't abuse it or it, it's, it slows us down. So another thing where we can uh, get some performance gains is understanding how the um, tracking of changes works. Um, Every time we flush, it, we flush something to the database, we have to, um, we have to calculate in a way how the, uh, how the changes, uh, uh, what changes were the, there were and how we should persist them to the database. So I quickly go to the, um, some examples. If we create it, we have an object, it's in the new state, we persist it, it's in the managed state, we flush the entity manager, and it will create, it will calculate all the changes, it will see it was a new uh, object, and it will create insert statements and do the transaction thing. If we get the object, we request an object, we first look in the identity map, we do a database query, we hydrate the object, we save it into the um, identity map, um, so the next uh, requests will uh, get it from there. If we update it, we just do the, we first get it, then we change the property, and we persist it in the entity manager, but since it is already managed, it won't do anything, so we just let the entity manager know that we want to persist it. And then we flush the database. Again, it will see it's an already existing entity. It will create update statements for it, and it will, it will perform a transaction. Um, when we delete it, we ask for removal, and only if we flush it, it will actually, uh, actually generate delete uh, SQL to delete the object. So. You see that we always have this calculate changes um, step. And the way it is done um, is by uh, using a specific tracking policy. 
Doctrine has three different tracking policies. Uh, the default one is deferred uh, implicit, and this is just the default one that will um, do a property by property comparison of all the uh, properties in the object. Um, and it will do that for everything that is reachable from within the identity map. So everything that is loaded and all the relations it has, it will just say flush, to the data, uh, flush it to the database. And it has a copy of all the, um, I, uh, all the entities that uh, are actively tracked with all the changes in it. And it has a copy of that with all the um, entities that have the state of the database. So it will just, every entity it, it has, um, it will do a property by property comparison. And then see, this one is changed. We have to update that. This one is changed. So this is the default one. But as you can imagine, if it does this on all the objects, it is the slowest one. So the second um, um, policy is to use the deferred explicit. And this is exactly the same. It will um, use a property by property comparison, but it, only, it will only do it uh, on entities that are um, explicitly persisted to the entity manager. So if they are loaded via a proxy uh, object or uh, something like that, it won't trigger the um, comparison. So here you can boost the, uh, boost the performance a bit by avoiding Doctrine to check every, um, every entity that it has under, um, under its identity map. And it's as simple as just adding a new um, annotation which said deferred explicit and it uh, works in a different way. The third one is the most performant one and it's Notify. Um, and it's the most performant one um, because the entity itself is responsible for uh, publishing um, events when something has changed. Um, this kind of is a bit um, crazy if you are using something like Doctrine to do all the calculations for you and then you start using Notify. Um, tracking policy, because then you just uh, are responsible yourself for um, saying to Doctrine, this field has changed. So it's the most performance one, because Doctrine doesn't have to do a thing. Um, so you do this by implementing uh, the event listener, the, event li um, the interface, and the interface just um, gets a list uh, of, uh, of built a list of listeners, and then in your um, in your entity, you have to manually um, notify all the listeners that that specific uh, field has changed. So if you want to go for maximum performance, do this, but then your code base will be uh, very polluted with um, um, yeah, event emissions. So further improvements. We can use a different um, result format. Um, and this is the hydration step I mentioned before that we are skipping. Um, this is usually done for read-only data because you don't get uh, objects back that you can um, change properties on and then fr uh, flush back to the database. So it's more like if you have um, big tables to show, you can use an um, array result or something. Um, and it's only scale, scale of values. Um, but it's also possible, uh, of, or it will also uh, cr give you a nested array graph. So if we have the query I showed you before, where we do a join of a reporter and uh, some products, and here we ask for the uh, array result, it will just generate a uh, nested array, uh, array with, um, with all the data. And here you can see it is nested because we have all the um, data from the user entity that is uh, added to the reporter key. So if you're just fetching data to uh, display on a page, don't bother with the hydration step, just use the plain array format. Um, if you have, um, for instance, a logging entity or a log entity, um, you don't want the uh, entity manager to calculate all the changes on that log entity. You just want to read them out and display them. So 
that, uh, for that you can use um, read-only entities. And it's just a flag in the entity um, where we say to Doctrine, fetch the data from the database, but if we hit flush, just skip all the classes, uh, all the product classes, because we don't want to uh, store them back in the database. Um, and I have a quick demo for that. Read only. Um, so this is a, um, here we fetch a bug, um, and the bug is not read-only, so this is the normal um, way of working. So we have a, uh, an existing bug, and we create a new bug, we persist the new bug, and change the uh, bug we already had, and if we flush it to the database, we want to see uh, multiple updates, or an insert statement and an update statement. And if we do it again, we want to see an update statement. So, no surprise, we have a uh, select statement for the one we already have. Then we, changed the pro uh, we create a new one, and we change the property of the first one, so we have an insert statement and an update statement. And then we change uh, the um, new bug again, and we have an update statement. If we, however, add the uh, read-only flag to the entity, to the product entity, and we do exactly the same, but with products instead of um, instead of bugs. We will see um, find statements and insert statements, but we won't see any update statements. So here we can see that we have a select statement, and the new one gets persisted, but the changing of product one is just completely ignored. And if we change a new product, it's again completely ignored because we said it was read-only. So if you have um, if you have entities that are only for um, <coughs> uh, only for uh, displaying things and you don't want to persist them back to the database, just flag them as read-only, and you're good to go. Uh, another thing you can use is using extra lazy collections. So we have the proxy objects. And these are the default uh, way of loading collections. Um, so this is the uh, lazy loaded one, where we inject the proxy object, and the moment we um, use that method, it will fetch it from the database. The opposite one is the eager um, loading, and uh, the eager loading is just it will force a um, inner join every time we load a product. For instance, if we say uh, we want the bug, and we want to eager load all the products associated with it. It will just use a big inner join and always load all the products uh, instead of lazy loading it uh, from the database. Extra lazy loading is um, the collections that are having an, another trick, um, and instead of always loading, uh, always lazy loading the collection. Um, when you hit the uh, property or if you hit the method. Um, if you do, for instance, a count on the collection, it will see it is a count and it won't first load all the uh, items from the database and then do a PHP count on top uh, on, the, on the collection and return that. It will see that it is a count and will do a optimized select uh, count from the database and uh, give that back. Um, it does the same for um, if you say, does this object, uh, does this collection contains an entity, then it will try to figure out if it can do a, uh, a different, uh, a different, um, yeah, a different query instead of la uh, loading everything. And this is done by if you uh, by adding a new uh, property to the annotation, where you say how you want it, how you want the fetch to work. So this is a. Uh, everything where I can tell you about the internals. Um, and only by using the internal, um, uh, only by using your knowledge of the internals of Doctrine, you can avoid a lot of things that um, make ORMs kind of hated by some people, because they just don't understand uh, how the internals work, and they are abusing the entity manager, and they're saying this is very slow, it's loading too much from the database. Um, so you have to, ORMs 
can't solve every problem, so you have to know where they are good at and where they're not good at. So um, I hope you have a better idea of um, when to use the ORM and how to optimize some uh, constructs. But if that's not enough, you can use caching and Doctrine. So first of all, we have a um, component ca um, called Doctrine Cache. And this has nothing to do with the uh, ORM, but this is just an um, interface which defines that we want to fetch um, data with a cache ID. We want to see if it is already cached. We want to save some data uh, with a specific ID, and we want to delete um, the, the, the cache ID. Um, so it has a lot of drivers. You have um, yeah, memcached, you have database drivers, you have file uh, caching. Um, and it is used in, a, in not only Doctrine, but in different um, in other uh, projects too. So this is the component, and Doctrine uses this component and Doctrine ORM. So the ORM um, can benefit from the caching too. Um, and we have different caches in the ORM. So the first cache is the um, metadata cache. And the metadata are, the, in our example, the annotations where we say to Doctrine, this property maps to this field in the database. And you can do, that, you can do this by annotations, YAML or XML. In 3.0, you, uh, uh, you can't use YAML anymore because it will be removed. So you have XML or annotations. <laughs> Um, but all the parsing is something you just have to cache because it's useless for every um, request you have on your website to do all the logic of, okay, this field is mapped to this, uh, data, uh, to this property. So this is a cache you have to have on by default. Um, if you don't use metadata cache, you just don't care about performance and you can leave the room because you don't care, uh, you don't care about uh, uh, speeding up your website. So um, metadata cache is just a flag or a configuration injection um, where you say, this is the kind of cache driver I want to use for the annotations or the XML. Um, and it will um, parse all the uh, mapping information once, put it in a cache, and then it won't have to be loaded again. The next one is query cache, and query cache um, is not the same as query caching in MySQL, but we have a um, dialect, the Doctrine query language, and that has to be translated to a, a SQL statement that the database engine can uh, understand. Um, and again, if you do this on every, uh, on every page um, request, you don't care about performance. So, those two are the, the, the ones you have to enable by default, and you will see uh, a spike in performance um, yeah, with uh, two simple steps. The third option is result cache. And the result cache stores your um, SQL um, query result into a cache that um, Doctrine can read uh, again, so you can skip the, um, the round trip to the database. Um, it stores the raw data, so you still have to um, hydrate all the objects, um, but that's not really uh, an issue if you can remove the network latency and the round trip to the database. You will see a, a big performance uh, boost already. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is that if you do the joins, like I said before, um, if you, you load a bug and you want to do a join with all the products, it will have a very big table where all the products are uh, listed on a line, but the bug information will be repeated every time. So this is how joins work. Um, and that information will be stored as is. So if you have very big um, um, join result sets, um, your cache will grow but storage is cheap, so that's, um, but this is something you have to keep in mind. Um, so you ha still have to hydrate objects. Um, and something you can do to go even further is custom caching. And custom caching is 
caching the hydrated result instead of um, thank you instead of always um, going through the to the hydrating loop again. So the hydrated result um, can be easily done by uh, building a decorator of uh, on the repository, where uh, instead of um, going to the database uh, of fetching all the um, data from the database and hydrating it, you can store it. Um, hydrate it in the cache and just bypass the repository altogether. But it's generally a bad idea. Uh, just look at the picture. And um, it's generally a bad idea because you are serializing entities and entities have collections, so you are serializing uh, collections. And unserializing um, objects and big collections and lazy loaded collections is just something that will uh, blow up in your face. Um, so, um, so, like I said, the moment you serialize an object, it uh, will get detached, and the uh, object manager won't know it exists. So, um, this is a pull request from, uh, uh, from 2011. Result caching used to cache the hydrated result, but they reverted that uh, for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, it's really a pain in the ass to um, figure out what was already hydrated and registering it to the object manager and saying, you already know this object, just here is a cached version. So they just skipped it all together and hydrate every time. Um, but PHP 7 will solve a lot of those issues too, so it's not really an issue anymore. So that are the basic cachings uh, that are available in uh, Doctrine. And there's a new thing since uh, 2.5, and that is second-level caching. Um, and second-level caching is surprisingly just like second-level caching uh, in a computer. So if we do the um, uh, comparison with Doctrine, we have the um, CPU is the um, unit of work, and it has a level one cache, and that is the identity map. Then we have the entity manager that stores um, um, non-hydrated data close by. And if it's not in the second level cache, it will just go for the memory, in our case, the database. So um, it, this is small, but um, fast. This is bigger, but less far. You know, you know why uh, they... Um, so the, 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 the speed goes down the further you go. So if you have um, a second level caching, um, you can speed up your application a bit more. So it doesn't cache entity instances. It, um, if you enable second level cache, you only store identifiers and the values. Um, so it doesn't store hydrate, hydrated um, entities. You just have... Um, plain data, it still has to um, hydrate in an entity. And it is best suited for read-only data, um, but you can use it also in a normal, uh, like you would just um, persist uh, things to the database. I will show in a moment. So we have three types. We have the entity data. The entity data is stored with the identifier and then a plain, uh, and the raw data as values. We have collection data and it will store the owner ID and then a list of IDs of the um, referenced uh, entities in that collection. So no data here is uh, stored, of no values are stored here. And we have query data, and query, uh, query second level caching uses the um, generated query, it hashes that, and it will just save a list of the IDs that match to that result and it will keep the uh, list of IDs in permanent uh, cache storage. So if you use caching on the collection of the query, you must, um, you must um, use entity data caching, or you won't be able to find the, the, uh, the data. So entity caching is straightforward. You just add a cache annotation, and you have entity data caching. The same for association caching. So it is pretty, uh, pretty simple to enable it and to have the uh, benefits from it. The caching has a concept of um, regions, and regions are um, used to invalidate caches and uh, to have different uh, TTLs on caching. 
So uh, every type had its own region, every uh, entity collection has its own re region. So this is used to um, label of our group a bunch of um, cache entries that you can delete safely. Um, you have some modes. You can use read-only data, which is um, the safest one, because um, if you update things, it will just skip the uh, it will just skip the uh, caching. You have non-strict read-write, and this is used. Um, this is a, a read-write mode without locking, so um, it will just do best effort of um, of writing your uh, of or updating your data. Um, and then you have the read-write, and that will use a lock on your caching uh, layer, but your caching driver must support the um, the locking. Uh, so we saw the entity and the collection cache. And the query cache, we just say, we create a query. This is what we will, uh, that, what we will query. And we want the entity, uh, we want the return to be cached. Um, I will skip the different modes. Um, so the query cache, Ignores, uh, sorry, the um, second level cache just um, is ignored by deleting and update queries because it just bypasses that because you can't cache, delete, or update queries. Um, so they are directly um, um, injected in the database. Um, but the problem there is it won't, um, it won't update the uh, cache. So you have to do that kind of manually. But you can do that with uh, some... Um, um, methods on the uh, entity manager. So here we have a, a hint that we say we just want, if we update, uh, if we perform this query, we just want to uh, evacuate uh, the complete cache. So um, everything will be deleted, the safest option, but yeah, you won't have any cache anymore. If we know we, up we are updating a country, we can say we want to update the entity region of this entity. So all the other caches are intact, but we want to update um, only the uh, we want to affect only the uh, entity uh, region, and to be more specific, if you are um, updating is a specific um, a specific entity, you can evict that entity all by itself. There's also a lot of logic in the background, um, and you also you have a concept called timestamped um, regions, and this is used by the persisters in the background. So if we um, fetch everything. Um, it will start. It will, st it will store the query that was used here, and it will store every um, entry in a uh, time-stamped region. So the mo if we ask it again, it will just load it from uh, the from the cache. And if we update the country and we flush it, the next time the persister will see that the specific um, cache region has a different timestamp than the previous one. So it, it does some kind of magic uh, also to um, help you with the query caching, uh, with the second level caching and validation. There are some limitations. Um, if you're using second level cache, you can't have a uh, back office system or something like that because the database will be uh, updated from another uh, application and you are um, looking to um, your second level cache close by. So you won't see any updates. Um, so it's you can you can use it if you also invalidate caches from the other side, but yeah, down the rabbit hole. Um, and then you, uh, the other limitation is that you ha you must use single primary keys, but that's not really an, an issue uh, because it's easier anyway to use single primary keys. Um, I have a. Um, Small tutorial on that, but I don't know if I have time to show it. <laughs> I'll just try. So, second level cache. I will store my um, caching in a data store uh, in a in a in a file. Um, Format. So here I just say that I want to create a caching um, factory. 
with um, default regions. Um, so per region you can uh, specify a TTL and stuff like that. We just use the default one. We say we want to use the file system cache and it, this directory. And then we just enable the second level caching and inject the factory to the configuration and the entity manager knows it, it has to use second level caching. So here we um, add a read-only um, method to the caching of the products within its own region. Um, so if we list the products the first time, it will uh, do a SQL uh, select statement. And here we can see that the This triggers um, uh, the second level caching uh, to store its data. So we have three um, data files with the data of the uh, entities. And we have a query caching um, uh, entry, which just has all the IDs of the, um, of the other entities. So this is the content of the data. We have a cache entry with an ID and the plain text uh, of the, the, and the plain values. And here we have the query cache, so the SQL is encoded in the key. And we have a list of identifiers that match the, um, the query. So here we execute it again, and we see the select statement is, um, isn't executed. The same for products. We have, um, we have the bug, and we mark the products as uh, cached. The first time it will fetch the bug and it, do the, it will do the lazy loading of the products, and the second time it has the product and cache and it won't generate, uh, it won't execute the SQL anymore. This is an example of the uh, query cache. Here we just say we want a uh, product with a specific name and we enable the caching on it. So, first one, query, second one, no query. Um, and that's the example of second level caching. Um, in conclusion, um, keep, in, keep in mind how the internals work to, perf to um, yeah, make sure your performance is, uh, is getting better. Um, always use the query and uh, mapping uh, caching uh, and use upcode caching. Um, yeah, because if you don't, you just, you're not interested in, in performance. Um, if you have heavy, query, uh, heavy queries uh, with a large result set, cache those uh, queries. And give second level caching a try. Um, you will see if, it is, if it's suitable for your uh, application or not. Um, but even if you're only just uh, caching the entities and not the queries or the uh, um, collections, you will see already uh, a performance boost because the data is cached uh, locally. Uh, and finally, the query cache of the doct doctrine is not the same as the second level query, query cache because this will store the raw data from the database and this will um, store a list of identifiers. So it's not, uh, it's not the same. Um, the slides will be available online uh, uh, on a joined in. Please give me feedback. Um, and thank you for your attention.